homophobic. Like, you wouldn't be free there if you're not a person who's the majority population, right? So the pain of xenophobia is also something that freedom should aspire to be, to escape. Yeah, I would love to think so. I was going to bring up, like, psychological pain okay. as an issue. Okay. Being in completely good health, have, like, a complete uh, access to, like, all sorts of health care, you can still be in, like, a ton of psychological pain if you're not okay. happy with your life. So even okay. if you live in a country that has, like, perfect health care, as you were talking about, if you're still in psychological pain, then okay. you're kind of, like, the freest country, the freest society would be the happiest society. Whatever the happiest society is. Happiest, healthiest, doing good. Okay. Um, fascinating. So I promised I would talk to you about a particular type of freedom, reproductive freedom, right? Um, so that's sort of our subject. What, um, now, now that we've sort of explored freedom as an idea, and, and, and there's we don't have perfect agreement, which is perfect um, in itself, um, uh, but when we, when, when we speak a little bit more specifically about this type, this particular type of freedom, reproductive freedom, I mean, what does that include? What kind of things might reproductive freedom include? The agency, the autonomy, perhaps the um, mode of escape from what? I would link reproductive freedom to unlimited decision-making capacity of the woman to have a baby. Okay. When I say unlimited, I mean unlimited. She get to make the choice when she want to be pregnant, who she want to have a kid with, um, what type of baby she wants to have, and um, at what point in her life she wants to have. Okay. That to me based on my concept of freedom, remember, we, are, yeah. we disagree on the yeah, no general fear. sense of freedom itself. Yeah. To me, freedom even doesn't exist, it's a rule. But in a sense, I would say freedom, reproductive freedom is unlimited or even unrestricted decision-making capacity of the woman to make it, not even of the male, because the male is not the one carrying the baby. If a man was to ever be pregnant, I bet the world would not have this population right now because we would think twice before getting it. Unfortunately, that's not how it goes. So that's my concept of reproductive freedom. Okay. Assuming that freedom doesn't exist, but it's a movement that a woman has a full control of it. Okay. So total power over, sovereignty over, agency regarding have manufacturing process. Okay. <laughs> what about the rest? I mean, reproductive freedom, I mean, that's a broad concept. To me, it's a broad umbrella phrase that includes a lot of stuff, and it could be, um, you know, it could regard um, uh, pregnancy, or it could be about other stuff. Yeah, I think reproductive, like, the name reproductive freedom might be more limited than what it actually covers. It is connected to our ability to reproduce, but at the same time, it also, for me, encompasses things like consent and um, like, sexual freedom. Right, sexual freedom, but also consent outside of sex. Like you can have a relationship where consent exists in sex, but not outside of sex. And I think that's part of what's important to me is that consent is something like almost like a lifestyle, like this understanding of permission and intent and. Uh, respect for other people's permission and intent and uh, like the nuance of that. Um, yeah, and so for me, like, I agree with you that reproductive freedom is often very women-focused in terms of because the majority of people getting pregnant are women. Um, it's, but I think it, it's also a very gender-neutral experience because women can't change our reproductive freedom without men as well. And I think that's much been shown, like, <laughs> if you don't have a majority, you can't usually make the change, and usually women are the majority, so. I feel like I agree with you as though the conversation or the majority of the decision or not necessarily responsibility, just the rights 
rest with women, but why leave the man completely out of it? Like, yes, there are a majority of deadbeat fathers, but I've seen a slew of deadbeat mothers who didn't deserve their children, who didn't even want their children, but they had them just so they could get a light like, child support check. I've seen very recently a guy who raises his own son every day he gets on the bus and does whatever he has to do with his son because the mother didn't want the child the mother wanted to have the child just to get a pfd check or whatever it's called i just moved here so i don't know if i said it right sounded good um the mother wanted to have the child just to get the check and so the father being a man stepped up and done the responsible thing like this is our son, but you're not just going to have our child out here doing whatever, running around just to get a check every year. He takes care of his child every year, and when his son gets his PDF, he puts it in an account for him. Leave it up to the mother. Had we put sole responsibility in her hands, who knows where this child would be. The only thing she'll be concerned about is getting this check every year. And like I said, I know multiple women who are concerned with the same thing every month. All they want is a child support check. So I'm not completely comfortable with leaving the whole decision or the complete responsibility of reproduction, like reproductive freedom, in the hands of a woman. Reproduction, even though it might be two person's job, yeah. it's a one person's activity. Yeah. Man, woman, yeah. but ultimately the woman is the one carrying it. Yeah. And she can reproduce without consent, without yeah. trust. That's why even when yeah. she gets pregnant, yes. she can get pregnant. Yeah. So if we have to talk about reproductive freedom, yeah. then I will give the ultimate movement yeah. possibility to the woman. Yeah. Yeah. Because she can trust someone, be pregnant, and end up, end up uh, being in force. Yeah. She can consent to be with someone right. and, uh, and end up with a screwed life, yeah. which she will not get. She, she didn't want to. Yeah. So in terms of a reproductive freedom, I would get again push it back to the woman's hand until we reach that point when it's up to them to sit down to decide based on the level of pain they feel during pregnancy and every single aspect of the decision yeah. of a reproductive process. Yeah. Now the relationship part, talk about reproduction, meaning producing a baby. Yeah. Until we formally and completely let them make that decision, yeah. there will be no freedom of reproduction. Let me ask you this. Um, a, this is, I guess, a different way of thinking about reproductive freedom, right? a little bit. Um, I had a, a close family member recently um, choose to undergo in vitro fertilization. Mm -hmm. right? So she, um, she elected to become pregnant, mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know, she went to a organization that the fertility, the fertility clinic yeah. I guess yeah and, and what she she had the opportunity to um, review profiles yep. of uh, like sperm donors yep. and she could she had the opportunity to like select based upon whatever criteria she mm -hmm. she wanted mm -hmm. which would be the, the genetic match that she wanted to create um, a child with, yep. and, and she became pregnant, and she gave birth to this child, and this all just recently happened. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it was right, everything was right in, in the story I've just described? Was it, was it, is it right for her to have that opportunity, to have that freedom? And it's another kind of reproductive <laughs> freedom. If it is available, yes, it's right for her to have it, because it, uh, it depends ultimately depends on accessibility as well. Can I go ahead, I want to ask say something later. Okay. That question makes me ask myself, how far are we as a society willing to go to create, like, what lengths are we willing to go to create options, and what kind of options are there, are those that allow women to choose Do we take it beyond in vitro? Like, it's more of like a technological question. Like, I'm thinking like, 
artificial wounds. Artific- exactly. Like, how, like, where's the limit to that? That's the that thing that's in my mind. When, if, are, you know, if, are there any limits to it? Yeah. Hold, hold on to it. He's going to come to you. Hold on to it. <laughs> He's, my head is boiling. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it, I don't, I mean, I mean, I'm not the creator of the world, so I don't, like, know how far it's going to go, but it makes, like, and this is kind of going back to, like, it's like the utilitarian question. It's like, what are we willing to do to give women full access to resources? Like, I don't know. Like, in my mind, like, I don't want to. I guess the limit for me is, like, I'm curious about, you know, that's what's so happening. We've been in the conversation a little bit. I mean, what if, like, when it comes to reproductive freedom, do does anyone think about the child here? Like, that's one thing. Like, a child is about to be born. We're talking about the rights of a woman, the rights of a father, or whatever. Um, but we haven't thought about the child yet. Like we haven't. I don't know. I just got here like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> but every discussion that I've had prior to this, a child is completely left out of the discussion. Um, this child is going to have to grow up. This child is going to be affected by whatever rights, wrongs, decisions that the parent or parents make. So in the conversation or the deal of reproductive rights, is the child even not included just because they're not born yet? They all have, in order to get to parental rights, you have to have reproductive rights because if you don't reproduce, you won't be a parent. And if you leave all the reproductive rights up to one parent, then this is going to endanger the child. That's why I initially asked, do we even think about the child here? Emily, you had your hand. Um, just the part of that that I'll speak to is I appreciate that you said when you address talking about the child because I think a lot of the justice conversation is focused um, primarily around things like abortion and the ability to decide whether or not to carry the child to term. But then I feel like often the conversation ends after the child is born and um, exactly things like having um, services, like child, um, the word is escaping me, yeah, or um, like good adoptive services or um, like food stamps, things that provide actual child care, I feel are a really important part of the reproductive discussion because if we're not supporting these people once they're born, then why even have the conversation? If we Thank you. <sighs> you guys read the Bible, right? Read the what? The Bible. <laughs> I read it very thoroughly. No, I'm sorry. I'll let this guy talk first because he was dying to <laughs> oh, say something. I was... Oh. Yeah, thank you for bringing up how, like, the conversation I had way back in the beginning was does the conversation of reproductive justice just stop when the child is born? But what I was dying to say earlier was in regards to the parent choosing a genetic match for what you would want the child to be. Uh-huh. Well, that seems like a all well and good, innocuous exercise in freedom of choice and being what you want. There's also a potentially, potentially unfortunate implication I thought of is, is it also implying that some people or genetic genes are superior to others? <laughs> well, your choice? does it violate the harm principle when someone um, goes into a fertility clinic and brings, um, I don't know, bias with them? as they're selecting, which inevitably they will. I mean, there's, there will be some bias that is restricting the judgment in one way or another of the person who is selecting a mate, unless it's lottery. I don't think I know anyone who has ever gone to a, a fertility clinic and said, I'll take anyone. partners that way either. That's right. Is it different or is it exactly the same?
little bit more. Like, what would you call it? Like, in a regulated manner. And that's fascinating. So, can you talk more about that? You mean, in a, like a, a romantic relationship setting? There's more explicit... No, or is it the I, other way around? Yeah, the other way around. Okay, so why is there less consent, permission, given in, like a, let's say, a romantic relationship that, that that's a sexual relationship that leads to reproductive outcome? Why is it less than in the, uh, why is it less explicit, I think is what you said, than the fertility clinic, where reproduction also happens? Well, you know, if you're in a romantic relationship with somebody, usually you have other concerns other than, like, tell me your entire family's medical history, <laughs> you know? Whereas if you're just, your only purpose is to have a child with them, you're probably more concerned about things like that. Does that, um, I don't know if this is the right word, but diminished context or diminished permission or diminished consent in a romantic relationship say, make that kind of reproductive freedom of less worth or of less value or of less validity, then, I mean, maybe we should all be doing all of our reproduction through fertility clinics, through IVF, or not with that. I don't think so, but if you chose to do that, that's fine with me. I mean... <laughs> I guess, I, do you know, you know what I mean? I guess what I'm suggesting is, if consent is maximized at the fertility clinic because it's transactional in a way, I guess. I mean, it's, it's, it's an explicit agreement. Um, and if we want to say, and tell me if there's, these are too many ifs um, for you, but um, if we want to say that, that freedom is maximized where consent is taking place, then it sounds to me a little bit like maybe we want to conclude that reproductive freedom is happening in the most um, appropriate, responsible way at the fertility clinic and not in a, through other modes. I don't think so because if you choose to have a child with your romantic partner, you're aware that you have all of these other options and you've chosen not to take them. So this conversation we have in here took place initially in the Bible, in Genesis 16, 16, okay. where Abraham and his wife Sarah, uh -huh. unable to have a child, Sarah decided to give Agar, the slave girl, to Abraham for the sole purpose of having a baby. So she has no reproductive right, but she was simply as a tool to reproduce, which means there was no need for trust, there was no need for consent because she's already a slave. The problem is it was negatively or not negatively, but it wasn't correctly dealt with. She ended up being pregnant because she's capable of, capable of reproducing, and she find her status changed. And Sarah then became jealous of her. And then she got thrown out of the house. Sarah did? Yeah. Sarah told Abraham that she cannot take it anymore. And Abraham just tell her to go. So as pregnant, as she's trying to walk away, she's outside of the house. The big voice in the sky, God himself <laughs> sent her an angel and tell her, hey, where are you going? She said, well, I'm running away from my mistress. And the angel tell her, return home and go submit yourself. However, you know, the big boss has listened to your afflictions. He's going to give you a son to whom you're going to give the, going to give the name Ismael. And then the punishment starts. It says, he's going to live like a wild donkey. His hands against everyone, everyone's hand against him. In response to your question of uh, what's the choice of, what's uh, the right of the child who's going to be born, if we are discussing the freedom of the product, I will talk about that. But right now we talk about the freedom of reproduction, which is the process of having a product. Mm -hmm. Usually that's kind of like a, I don't want to say second conversation, but you have to pass the freedom of reproduction to reach the, uh, the conversation about the, uh, the product. So mm -hmm. that child 
was cursed while in the womb. And this is the Almighty God telling that slave girl when she was physically, emotionally, sexually abused because she had no say. And then because she's pregnant, saying your child is going to live like a wild donkey. His hands against everyone, everyone's hands against him. That's not me quoting. This is me reading the, the, the specific part of Genesis 16, 16. At what point is freedom considered in this subject? I don't see anyone. She has no freedom of her decision. She has no freedom of how she's going to have it. She has no freedom of saying anything. Even when she tried to say something, she was kicked out of the house. And then big boy, the child was, you know, end up being cursed at the end. So coming back into our society, I will again say the woman being capable of a good or bad choice is woman's past uh, problem. Obviously, if we have a structured education, if she cannot make a, uh, a sound decision, eventually she will go to school or she will learn how to make good decisions. However, I don't think I have the right to tell a woman or to tell anybody that that woman doesn't have the right decision to be made because she what, drink or because she, 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 she smokes. Men does do. So at some point, if we talk about freedom, which is unlimited restriction of any kind of movement, I'll throw it back to the woman. At this point, I can stay up to five. <laughs> <laughs> you all should keep going. I do have to run. Okay. But um, let me just say it's um, an honor for me to, to join you. And, um, yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, it's clear when you have more than an hour. Yeah. You should keep going. <laughs> I, you you I, didn't I, say anything about my, yourself my, specifically. My, what do you well, do? What do I? Me? <laughs> uh, I'm just here to ask questions. I'm not here. No, what do you do? I'm a professor in the political science department. Political science department. Okay, what do you teach? Political science? Political theory. Political I theory. teach what we're doing. This is what I do. Okay. Um, so, I, anyway, I just really appreciate your um, entertaining my visit and um, appreciate the invitation. And I think um, that this couldn't be more important to discuss and debate.